Hello and welcome to our virtual convention. Not able to meet in person. We all thought uh, on PWMI Council that it would be a good thing to have a virtual conference. And so uh, this is part of it. And what I want to do uh, with the message today is to go to the book of Micah and say something about Micah's messianic message. And I trust that as we go through, it will give you uh, a thirst for Bible prophecy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would be with us and undertake for us. Pray that as we open the book, that you would challenge us from it and pray that you would give us a deeper understanding of prophetic truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple of verses at the beginning. Uh, to kind of set the scene, chapter 4 and verse 1, and chapter 5 and verse 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto thee, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah who preached a similar message to that prophet, reminding us of the old maxim that in the mouth of two or three witnesses a thing would be established. His message was really a summary of Isaiah's much more comprehensive message. In chapter three, or in chapter one rather, uh, through to chapter three, he proclaimed a message of retribution. The contents of these chapters describe the coming judgment of the Lord on a stiff-necked and rebellious people. In chapters 4 and 5, he preached about restoration. God in wrath remembers mercy. And these next chapters promise to the nation bright hope for tomorrow. And in chapters 6 through 7, uh, he made a plea for repentance. In these final chapters plead for the nation's repentance. As summarized in chapter 6, verse 8, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Our interest is in that middle section where the prophet, after predicting judgment on Judah, comforts the people with the hope of future restoration. Now, quite clearly, the context of these chapters are millennial. As indeed the language would indicate, it speaks of a restored nation in an exalted position dwelling in peace among the Gentile nations. Now this summary of future restoration for Israel is a summary that's viewed in three acts. Restoration described, 4, 1 to 8. Restoration delayed, 4, 9 to 5, 6. And restoration detailed, 5, 7 through 15. Let's begin then by considering restoration described, chapter 4, 1 through 8. After three chapters of threatening judgment on Judah, Jehovah through his prophet Micah now comforts his people with the promise of future restoration. Notice the context is in the last days, chapter 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass. A phrase that's used in the Old Testament to depict either the tribulation or millennial kingdom to come. According to the prophet here, in the last days the kingdom would be established and several things about it would be revealed. In the first instance, we note the preeminence of the kingdom. Chapter 4, verse 1 again. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established, notice this, in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow onto it. Present circumstances for uh, God's people uh, here in this Old Testament age looked grim. Very grim indeed. The two Israelite kingdoms were under pressure. The Assyrians threatened Israel to the north and Judah to the south. But although the present outlook was grim, the future onlook was glorious. In a passage similar to that in Isaiah chapter 2, the prophet points the people 
to a future time when the temple, the house of the Lord, would be exalted in a remodeled Jerusalem. After the tribulation, there will be some physical changes uh, to the city of Jerusalem. The prophet Zechariah that describes some of these changes. Chapter 14 and verse 10 of his prophecy. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. It shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate under the place of the first gate, under the corner gate, and from the tower of Haniel onto the king's wine presses. The impression given here is of an exalted city that would be the capital of the world. Its most prominent feature, the rebuilt temple. What is now the world's most loathed city because of the turmoil over it will become the world's most loved city because of the tranquility in it. What about the prospect of the kingdom then in verse 2 of chapter 4? And many nations shall come and say, come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and will walk in his paths. Uh, uh, for the Lord shall go forth uh, of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah's prophecy mirrors Isaiah's here concerning the prospect of the coming kingdom. Come back with me, if you would, to that major prophecy, the prophecy of Isaiah. And we're in chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. These two great prophets, Isaiah and Micah, are in absolute harmony as to what awaits the nation and the nations in a coming day. In that day, Jerusalem will be a metropolis, the center of worship for the nations. The nations will look to the city as a place of learning and knowledge, a place to be enlightened in the ways and in the word of the Lord. Then in verses 3 and 5 of chapter 4, we have the peace of the kingdom. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall set every man under his vine, under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Universal peace will ensue. That which has proved elusive down throughout history will be achieved with the coming kingdom. To date, uh, you may be interested to know that humanity has only experienced 8% of time without warfare during recorded history. Not only would there be an absence of war in the coming kingdom, but even of thinking about war. All weapons uh, will be decommissioned. The countless billions spent uh, on the arms race will be redirected towards peaceful pursuits. The picture painted in verse 4 is one of peace and tranquility. It depicts a quality of life that is, quite frankly, unobtainable today. Now, another rendering of verse 5 would be, the wall the nations follow their respect of gods, we will follow the Lord our God forever. It's not a prediction of how things would be, but rather a comment of how things are. He's reflecting upon what was then uh, prevalent. The nations and many peoples would, would follow their own gods, but, but he would continue to follow his God, the one true God. Uh, many people would follow uh, these other gods because uh, they didn't think 
about the possibility of a future glorious kingdom for Israel. They saw things the way they were. But the prophet saw things that never had been, no, nor never shall be, until the kingdom is established. And so therefore, what he's saying is, he will continue to follow his God. Then in verses 6 through 8, we have the people of the kingdom. In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that exalted a remnant, and her that was cast uh, far off a, a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tar of the flock, at the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. It's still the case today that the majority of Jews live outside of the land of Israel. Some, of course, are prisoners of repressive regimes held there against their will. Others are voluntary exiles living in the free world and presently unwilling to leave for Israel. But Micah sees a day coming when the Jews in their entirety would be restored to the land, first of all in weakness and then ruling in power. The picture painted here in verse 6 of the end time Jewish remnant is clearly one of weakness. She is seen as lame, having been driven out and afflicted, hated and despised. But this same company would rise to take worldwide dominion, according to the prophet here in verses 7 to 8. She who was weak would become strong because the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion. That's what will make the difference. Note the references in verse 8 to the tar and the stronghold. Now these probably refer to the tar of Edar near Bethlehem, the city of David, and the stronghold of Ophel being the citadel from where David reigned. By these references, Micah indicated that he anticipated a full and complete restoration to the land, such as during the time of David, and Solomon's reign. Looking back to that glorious period, he, he's saying to the people, look, uh, when you look forward, then you see what uh, once was, and even greater than this, a restored nation, as was um, evident during the time of David, but even stronger than that. Now we come in chapter 4, verses 9 through 5, 6, to restoration delayed. As one commentator poetically says, the vision of a gloriously restored and ruling Israel faded from Micah's view. In its place, the mists rolled in. Through them, he could discern present and future troubles for the nation. We leave this glorious vision in chapter 4, at 1 through 8, now to consider restoration delayed. Micah saw the people of God in his day and in the last days as he looked through the gloom, but even though clouds of thick darkness surrounded Israel, there was a bright light on the horizon. Yes, it's true. Uh, he's, he's pulling back a little bit now. After uh, striding forward and looking to the glorious future ahead, he's pulling back a little bit. But even through the gloom, even through the mist, he still sees a bright light on the horizon. Now, there are two things that are evident from these verses. Israel's present and future misery and Israel's future coming Messiah. Let's begin then by considering Israel's present and future misery. Chapter 4, verse 9 to 5, verse 1. 
Two empires would dominate the nation, and these now loomed on their horizon. Babylon's empire and the beast's empire. Firstly, the Babylonian empire. Chapter 4, 9 through 10. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy uh, ruler, sorry, is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Like a woman in travail. For now shalt go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. The Babylonians didn't come for a century after the time of Micah. But looking into the future, the prophet saw an empty throne. Why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? The absence of the king and counselor pertained to a time, a time when the nation would be in exile when they were carried away to Babylon. He likened Israel's demise here to a woman in labor. But instead of joy at the end of her labor, as is most often the case, she would be delivered into even greater distress, exile in Babylon. But the prophet also saw the return from exile in Babylon. The latter part of verse 10. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. The exile was temperate. They would be brought back. And we know from history that they were. God sent Cyrus to deliver them. When dispersed again after AD 70, God will send Christ to deliver them. That brings us to the beast's empire. Chapter 4, 11 through 5, 1. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. that say, let her be defiled. And let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite and judge Israel with a rod upon the cheek further into the future, beyond the Babylonian exile, way beyond the Babylonian exile. The prophet sees a time when many nations, not just one nation, but many nations would be against Israel. Opposition towards Israel will reach its peak, we know, in the dark days of the tribulation, when the beast, the Antichrist, will reign. We see opposition against Israel now. It is as nothing compared to what will come. During the empire of the beast, persecution of Israel will be intense. Jesus said of it, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. John in Revelation describing it says, When the dragon, that's the devil, saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, which brought forth the man-child. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The dragon, the devil, will use the Antichrist as an instrument of his persecution. Another rendering of uh, Verse 11b puts it, they say Jerusalem must be desecrated so we can gloat over Zion. The holy city, which has been the subject of many sieges down the years, will be sieged again, according to the prophet Zechariah in the last days. The city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go into captivity (laughs) and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. 
But you see, there was one thing that wasn't taken into account. What wasn't taken into account was God. The world's leaders under the Antichrist will set out to destroy the Jews once and for all, as others in the past have attempted to do and feel. But the Lord has other plans. Other plans which they are ignorant of. As the psalmist, anticipating this time, says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God will defeat the nations that are gathered against Israel at that time. Using the metaphor of the threshing floor, the prophet describes the defeat of Israel's enemies. The nations will then be gathered like sheaves of corn to the threshing floor where God will use Israel to thresh them. Anticipated is the uh, practice of oxen treading out the corn, a graphic image of the destruction of Gentile power and dominion. Note the words, thou shalt beat in pieces many people. In the process, the Gentile nations will be stripped of their wealth and it will be dedicated to the Lord. I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now the first verse of chapter 5 really belongs to the end of chapter 4 and that's the way it appears actually in the Hebrew Bible. It's a call for Israel to prepare herself for what lies ahead. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. The reference to the smiting of the judge, a metaphor for defeat and surrender, and probably refers to the mistreatment of Israel's rulers. That brings us then, in chapter 5, 2 through 6, to Israel's perfect future Messiah. What follows next is nothing short of a remarkable prophecy of Israel's coming Messiah, beginning with his incarnation and concluding at his coronation. And as such, we want to make note of three things in respect to it. First of all, the incarnation of Messiah. Look at verse 2. But thy Bethlehem Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. Now there are several truths about the incarnation uh, that are revealed here. First of all, very obviously, is the place of his birth. Bethlehem lies about six miles southwest of Jerusalem. Bethlehem means house of bread, and Ephrata means fruitful. And when we put this together, it's not at all without significance, seeing that the one who was to be born here was the bread of life and the true vine. He, therefore, is the sustainer and the source of life. Then consider the littleness of Bethlehem, reminding us surely that God chooses the insignificant things of this world to confound the greater. One commentator observes, Micah gives the sentence, the turn he does for the purpose of bringing out sharply the contrast between the natural smallness of Bethlehem and the exalted dignity to which it would rise through the fact that the Messiah would issue from it. From little Bethlehem, not great Jerusalem, would Messiah come. But also hinted here at is the purpose of his birth. Out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. The babe born in humble surroundings in Bethlehem in Judah was born to be king. That's what the angel told Mary as recorded in Luke chapter 1. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom 
there shall be no end. Ultimately, he would deliver the program that Micah outlined in the first half of chapter 4 of this prophecy. The blessings of the millennial kingdom, worldwide peace and prosperity, would only be delivered when Messiah came. That's the purpose for which he was born. It hasn't happened yet for Micah, uh, like all the uh, prophets before and after him, didn't anticipate the parenthesis between the first and second comings of Christ. What about the pre-existence before his birth? Note again the phrase in 5 verse 2, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Another rendering of this reads, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. The one to be born in Bethlehem existed long before Bethlehem. John writing of him says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Isaiah, a contemporary of Micah, revealed that the child born of a virgin in Bethlehem would be called Emmanuel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The meaning of which is God with us. As God, he is eternal. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, he was there. For it was he who laid them. As John in his gospel says, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. The apostle Paul, uh, writing uh, of him, emphatically states, he is before all things and by him all things consist. His birth in Bethlehem Ephrata was an incarnation. Again, it's John in his account of the gospel that insightfully says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Paul, uh, the great apostle, is in full agreement stating that God was manifest in the flesh. What an amazing condescension that God would come down to our level in order to redeem us. As Paul says in Galatians, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What glorious truths connected with the incarnation of Christ. But then I want you to notice in chapter 5, verse 3, the interregnum before Messiah. Therefore will he give them up until the time that he shall, she shall, sorry, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Here, the prophet Micah reveals an interval in time between his time, that is the time when he wrote, and the incarnation. Note his words, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. A paraphrase of this part of the verse reads, So the Lord will hand the people of Israel over to their enemies until the time when the woman in labor gives birth it reminds us on revelation 12 1 and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered after that israel would be regathered in return then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of israel then will Isaiah's prophecy be fulfilled. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. But what Micah did not see was the further interval between the birth of Messiah and his coronation as king of Israel. For it is then, at that time, that the remnant will return. He's been talking about a remnant returning. That's the time when they'll return. In verses 4 through 6, we have the investiture of Messiah. And he shall stand 
and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now uh, shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. And uh, this man shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land, and we shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we <coughs> rise against him, seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod, in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. Micah, as he looks again across the mountain peaks of prophecy, sees beyond the first coming and focuses now again on the second coming. Two characteristics of uh, this future manifestation of Messiah are considered. The shepherd, he'd be a shepherd. Look again at verse 4. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now shall be, uh, he be great unto the ends of the earth. Another rendering of the opening phrase of verse 4 would read, he will assume his post and shepherd the people. Israel, of course, was a nation that had known many false shepherds. Ezekiel makes mention of them in his book and lists their sins against the nation. Very quickly, let me uh, give you a little flavor of uh, Ezekiel's tirade against the false shepherds of Israel. Woe uh, be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Shall not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The disease be not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered throughout all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. What an indictment. But of course, when the true shepherd comes, as Micah says, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. He shall care for the sheep. As one paraphrase puts it, they will live securely. But not only do we see the image of Messiah here as a shepherd, also as a soldier, verses 5 and 6. And this man shall be at peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land. And when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall uh, we rise uh, against him. Seven shepherds and eight principal men. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod, and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land. And when he treadeth within our borders. Assyria was the great power in Micah's day. And the term Assyrian came to be known as a synonym for war. Dr. Tadford says here, It seems clear that the prophet's revelation referred not to the Assyrian of the past, but to the Assyrian of the future. It's most likely a reference to the Antichrist and his army. At that time, Christ shall come with his army from heaven and defeat them. Note the phrase, then shall we uh, raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. There'll be raised up against the Assyrian a sufficient number and more to defeat him. That's surely the meaning of seven and eight here. Seven being the complete number and eight being even more. Above all, as the prophet says, and this man shall be the peace. The world longs for peace, but there will be no peace until the coming of the Prince of Peace. And when he comes, he will establish peace. That brings us to restoration detail. 7 through 15. He's talked about it being delayed. Now he talks about it being detailed. 
a section of Micah's great prophecy ends with a fourfold promise to Israel. Number one, the remnant, verses seven through eight. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of the people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob uh, shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. The dispersal of the Jews among the nations is part of God's judgment on them. But Micah envisages here not a dispersal in judgment, but a dispersal in blessing when the Jewish remnant during the kingdom will come and be like the Jew and showers a source of refreshment to the nations. They will not have their trust in men as we are here told, that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. That was a bad mistake of the past. They trusted in men. They made alliances where they shouldn't. Uh, and they left the Lord their God, uh, the one who had pledged himself uh, to stand with them. And they made alliances with uh, the land of Egypt and others. And of course, we know uh, the result. Jury during the dispersal and judgment was weak, and when the presence of the Jews in the nation uh, was resented, the Jews were the subject of many persecutions. But here the tables are turned. And uh, should their presence be resented, they'll be like a lion among its prey. No longer will the Jewish people be, be weak. No longer will they be able to be carted away, to taken to concentration camps and the like. No longer will uh, the pogroms against them succeed. For if there are those who oppose them and resent them during this time, they will be as a lion towards them. Then in verse 9, we have the recovery. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. When Micah wrote this prophecy, he did so against the backdrop of imminent invasion. The Assyrians were beginning to stir and tiny Judah would be up against it. No match for this uh, burgeoning uh, new empire. But looking down the corridors of time beyond the fall of Samaria and the siege of Jerusalem, the first and second dispersions to the time of the end, he saw a recovery of fortunes for the Jewish people. No more would Israel's enemies be successful against her. But then, thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. Then in verses 10 through 14, we have the revival. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, I will cut off uh, thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, and I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds, and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine land, thine hand. And uh, thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and uh, thy standing images out of the midst of thee. And thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands, and I will pluck up uh, thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. <clears throat> All of the things that Israel formerly trusted on in the past will be taken away from her. In that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses in the midst of thee, destroy thy chariots, cut off the cities of thy land, throw down all thy strongholds, so I will destroy thy cities. All of the sins that Israel were tempted by in the past will be removed from her. Cut off witchcrafts out of thy hand. No more soothsayers. Graven images will also be cut off. Standing images out of the midst of thee. And thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee. As such the nation will have nowhere else to turn but to the Lord. And when they do all forms of false worship 
will be removed. And then in verse 15, we have the revenge. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. At the time of the end, Gentile world dominion will cease as the mass, the mass military might of Gentile power will be defeated and overthrown in the valley of Megiddo and thereafter the surviving nations will be summoned at the valley of Jehoshaphat for judgment. Friends, a glorious future awaits the Jewish people when their Messiah comes as foreseen by the prophets. But before that messianic day dawns, there will be a time of tribulation. It'll be a time of purging for Israel. But the surviving remnant, cleansed from all impurities and cured forever of all her idolatrous ways, will enter into the messianic age. As Micah says at the conclusion of his book, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou will perform the truth of Jacob and the mercy of Abraham, which thou hast sown unto our fathers, sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Micah's messianic message, a message of hope for Israel. So far, all that Micah has said that is past has come true. Therefore, we have every confidence that what he says about the future will also be literally fulfilled. May God bless his word to our hearts.